just by way of brief introduction, I think the thing that makes my view different on health is that I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician. And in veterinary medicine, we don't have health insurance for animals like we do people. And if we were to use a human health care type of system for livestock, for instance, it would be sticker shock for you. Your hamburger would cost you $275 a pound just to pay for the health care. So we learned a long time ago in the animal industry that we could keep the price of animal products such as meat and dairy and poultry and eggs down where the average American could afford to eat them every day simply by eliminating health care costs. That's, I think, a very profound statement simply by eliminating health care costs. We do that in animals with simple little nutritional formulas. That's why we have mouse pellets and rat pellets and hamster pellets and gerbil pellets and guinea pig pellets and rabbit pellets and canned and dry dog and cat food. And we have sheep pellets and horse pellets and calf pellets and dairy pellets and monkey pellets and catfish pellets and turkey pellets and duck pellets and ostrich pellets and on and on and on. You get the picture. Uh, the reason why we put all these various animal diets into the pelletized farm is so that every mouthful is biochemically perfect. Even the stupidest animal in the group gets a perfect diet. They can't sort through and just eat only the sunflower seeds or the raisins. Their health and production is not dependent on their choices of food. We command them to eat a certain way, and that's the way they eat. And we get a uniform, a projected, expected production. We've been so successful at doing this over the last 75 years that in the animal industry, we've eliminated about 900 different diseases that still plague human beings. We've doubled and tripled their historical lifespans in the last 60 years. Uh, uh, 60 years ago, if you're old enough to remember, an old dog used to be 10 years old. Today, an old dog is 20-something. Uh, 10 years ago, an old cat was 12. Today, an old cat's 25 or 30. And we didn't do that with wonder drugs and genetically engineered proteins or stem cells or transplants. We did that simply by adding vitamins and minerals and trace minerals to their food. And that kind of excited me. Uh, one more little thing about my background. On a large grant from the National Institutes of Health during the 1960s, I worked with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom days. I was one of his uh, veterinarians and worked on this research project. Did over 17,500 autopsies and over 454 species of animals and 3,000 human beings for a comparison. And what I learned was, ladies and gentlemen, was that every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. So since 1964, I've been working very hard to get the health industry to appreciate this and not treat nutrition as the stepchild of health, but actually as the front piece of health. And it was not very successful. So I went back to school, Portland, Oregon, became a, actually a naturopathic physician, which is kind of like an osteopath in Oregon. Uh, we're primary care physicians. And we were able to begin in 1978 to use everything I'd learned in veterinary nutrition on my human patients. And I'm here to tell you that the concept of preventing and curing diseases in animals with nutritional formulas works just the same in people. These are the sort of things I would collect to um, share with my patients. I, I wanted to give my patients a gift, uh, sort of an incentive or a bribe to come to me as their doctor. And I promised them I'd do everything I could to get them to live to be 100 instead of 75. And uh, this particular issue, September 2000 of uh, Scientific American, was almost totally devoted to 100-year-old people and, and what they did differently and so forth. There were articles in there by medical doctors and geneticists and gerontologists and nutritionists, and they were all coming from different directions. So there was a summary at the end telling you what you were supposed to learn by reading all this different stuff. And basically, they were editorially scratching their head. They couldn't figure out why the people who lived to be 100 were the ones who were rebellious and didn't listen to their doctor's instructions. The people who followed the doctor's instructions didn't make it to 100. And they couldn't figure out why. And they wanted to do some big research project to figure out why. Well, you don't have to figure it too long because if the medical doctor's advice isn't bringing you to 100, it's not good advice. That's pretty simple. You don't need a $50 million study to figure that out. Going back to April of 1992, 12 years ago, almost 12 and a half years ago, this was a cover article, Time Magazine, very profound article. Uh, I think there were six positive pages on nutrition uh, in this issue. Again, April, I think it was April 6th or April 7th, 1992, the real power of vitamins. And they meant, as most people do when they say vitamins, they mean vitamins and minerals. You know, nobody says, honey, did you take your vitamin B1, B2, B3, B5, B6? Did you take your folic acid, your bine, your choline, your B12? Did you take your calcium, magnesium, manganese? Did you take your phenylalanine and your arginine and your cysteine, your methionine, amino acids, did you take your omega-3s. People say, honey, did you take your vitamins this morning? And it's kind of this generic shorthand for did you take your supplements? And they use it the same way here because it kind of fit the layout. Uh, the real power of vitamins and minerals, et cetera, et cetera. New research shows it may help fight cancer, heart disease, and the ravages of aging. 
Well, back um, when I started seeing human patients back in 1978 as a physician, I wanted to have some kind of animal model, being a veterinarian, and a human model to give them so they didn't think it was some outrageous thing that I was coming up with, some pipe dream. And looking around, sure enough, I found a guy by the name of Clive McKay, and he did his research back in the 1920s, and uh, geneticists like to claim him, but he was just a physiologist. He published his landmark papers in 1935, and basically what he did was take three groups of rats and, and gave them the same basic rat pellet of the day from the 1920s, which is quite a remarkable step because research rats before this rat pellet would only live maybe six to ten months after weaning when they just feed them rolled oats and carrots and things like that. But once they came out with the nutritional pellet of the day, they lived to be an average of two years, and that was just remarkable for research. Well. He was the only guy at that time who was tinkering around with macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates to see what you could do to make the animals live longer. And in group number two, he gave them the same basic pellet as group number one, but he cut the carbohydrate calories by 30%, kept the vitamins and minerals the same, and they lived 50% longer than group number one. Got kind of excited about that. So group number three, he cut the carbohydrates by 60% from group number one, kept the vitamins and minerals the same, and they lived twice as long and they thought they had the answer. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. Uh, when they redid the studies in pigs and dogs and monkeys and spiders and all kinds of bugs and birds and things, they found out that the secret was that he kept the vitamins and minerals the same. And the, the secret to this longevity by tinkering with the food is that you want to have a high level of vitamins and minerals per carbohydrate calorie. That's one of the reasons why low-carb diets are good for you, and why they work to help you lose weight but also live longer. Even though people aren't supplementing, they have a modest amount of vitamins and minerals in their diet. And if they cut the carbohydrates, that means your concentration of vitamins and minerals per carbohydrate calorie is going up. And that's the thing you have to look for. Well, I had a very exciting animal model that went back to 1935. Then I wanted a human model. And I ran into a guy by the name of Art Linkletter. How many of you remember Art Linkletter? Yeah, if you're over 40 years old, you remember Art Linkletter. He was a great TV and radio uh, host, and he invented the kids say the funniest things concepts and he was very funny without saying four letter words so I always appreciated him and it was kind of interesting that I ran into him and I was looking for a human model for 100 year olds and he wanted to live to be 100 and there was all kinds of newspaper interviews I ran into uh, he wanted to be 100 and, and he got kind of excited about this possibility by reading a uh, 1933 Pulitzer Prize winning novel by James Hilton called Lost Horizon okay well Lost Horizon if, if you don't remember the book it coined a term, James Hilton coined a term called Shangri-La. How many of you ever heard of Shangri-La? I think most people have heard of that. And um, this was this mythical place, kind of like a place where you could live in this micro-environment that was perfect, almost like Eden, and you could eat everything there, and you lived a spiritual life, and you could live to be 200, 300 years of age. And it was based on some people in what is now eastern Pakistan in a single valley called Hunza. Art Linkletter hired an eye doctor by the name of Alan Bannock to go to Hunza and find out what their secret was because at the time, in the 1930s, they were the healthiest and the longest lived people on earth. Now the most remarkable thing about the Hunzas is they were a third world country. They had no electricity, no indoor plumbing, no telephones. They had no hospitals, no doctors, no pharmacies, no pharmaceuticals, no prescriptions. I mean, they had nothing. And yet they were the longest lived and healthiest people on earth. And so uh, Art Linkletter wanted to find out what their secret was. So, Alan Bannock goes there, and he really couldn't quite pick it out. He was an eye doctor, didn't know a lot about everything. So he was very good about writing about what he observed, but he didn't pinpoint any particular thing. He just says, well, here it all is. Pick what you want. But there are two things that were valuable, knowing what we know about Clive McKay's animal models. Number one, these people live in a single valley at 19,500 foot elevation. If you've ever farmed, you know that when you're above the timber line like that, I mean, kind of like double. The timber line is like 7,000 feet. So we're at almost three times the height of the timber line, and nothing grows there. Very hostile environment. They couldn't grow rice. They couldn't grow potatoes. Uh, they couldn't grow corn, but they could grow wheat. But because of the very short and very hostile growing season, their yield was very, very small. And their sum total of their carbohydrate intake each day was one little chapati bread, looked like a tortilla, a flour tortilla, a very small one, one a day per person. Those are some total of their carbohydrate intake. The rest of their food was lamb and mutton, goat, cheese and milk. Uh, they cooked in butter. And that was it. They had a few vegetables, you know, like tomatoes and carrots and cabbage. And so they had a very low carbohydrate diet. So that kind of fit Clyde McKay's thing, 60% less carbohydrate than the 
control rats. Well, where do they get their extra minerals or extra vitamins? Well, it so happens, Alan Bannock pointed out something that I used to do as a kid in these people. This is a, a cultural thing that they did that occurs thousands of years ago in Asians and Europeans and Africans. It's, I don't know who came up with it first, but it's been used since the beginning of time, since the dawn of written history. And uh, it's something many of you have done. How many of you have ever taken wood ashes from a fireplace or a cooking stove and put in your garden? How many have ever done that? Okay. Well, he noted that every morning they did that. They took the wood ashes from their fireplaces and their heating fires, and they put these wood ashes in their gardens every morning. Well, the wood ashes are the minerals that are left when you burn away the carbon in the wood. So every morning they were putting minerals back into their gardens. Now, that, that is a very profound thing. It sounds so simple. Now, we as Americans used to do that because we all came from a background of Europeans or Asians or Africans. And so everybody came to the United States in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s with this history. But something changed in our culture in 1940. This was the end of healthy Americans in 1940. It actually started before that. It actually started the Industrial Revolution. But it was just a trickle. But they, they shut the spigot off for uh, intake of minerals in 1940. What happened in 1940? Everybody got a modern kitchen. Electricity, gas, propane. Are there any wood ashes left when you cook with an electric stove? Are there any wood ashes left when you cook with natural gas? Are there any wood ashes left when you cook with propane or a microwave? No. And so as soon as we got the modern kitchen, there was no more wood ashes to put into the gardens. And so our source of minerals dried up just like flipping off a switch. And so we're not eating the same as we did, just even culturally. Uh, we're not eating the same. Just assuming that all our vegetables uh, are as healthy as they were 100 years ago, we're not putting the minerals back in because we don't have the wood ashes from our cooking fires and our heating fires to put back in the land. Well, human beings need 90 essential nutrients, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids to flourish and reproduce and do well and repel diseases and so forth. And plants only need nine. Plants are very simple organisms. I have a degree in agriculture, and I can tell you, Factually, the plants only require nine to be uh, in, a, in a state of flourishing and robust health, but they can get away with three. You give the farmer the maximum yields in terms of tons and bushels per acre. That's why you see bags of fertilizer with NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, 10, 10, 10, 10, 16, 12, because different plants require different ratios of those three elements. One's an element, the other two are minerals. And we need 60. We're going to get the other 57. Well, first of all, our food plants cannot give you everything you need just by eating well. Plants are very good about making vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids when they're well nourished. They have to have at least those three nutrients, NPK, to make vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. These are carbon compounds, and plants can take carbon dioxide out of the air and use the sun's energy in a process known as photosynthesis to manufacture long carbon chains. And many of these are actually uh, configured into vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. And plants can do that. They can make it. And if you spend eight hours a day shopping and picking out everything at the perfect stage of ripeness and you cook food properly and you store food properly, you might, only with the grace of God, get enough vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. But it's worse than Vegas when it comes to the minerals. Plants cannot manufacture minerals. If you can find me any plant that will manufacture any mineral, I don't care if it's lead, I'll give you a million dollars in small bills, tax-free, uh, in any offshore account you want. You'll be a bazillionaire soon. But there are no such plants. Plants don't make minerals. They can't make minerals. They're not genetically capable of making minerals. They get their minerals from the soil. And unfortunately, nutritional minerals do not occur in a uniform blanket around the crust of the earth. Nutritional minerals occur in veins like chocolate and chocolate ripple ice cream. Nutritional minerals occur in veins like gold and silver. And the odds of you and I getting all 60 essential minerals just by eating well is zero. I don't care if you spend a million dollars a day for food and you live on the very finest caviar and Australian wine and artichoke hearts imported from Costa Rica and all this wonderful food, guess what? You're still going to be deficient in minerals. As I told you, I did all this research and found out that every animal and every human being who died of natural causes died of a nutritional deficiency disease. And as you might expect, spending the multi-millions of dollars, actually seven and a half million dollars to do this research, wrote several papers, wrote 75 scientific papers, were published in medical journals, veterinary journals, wrote textbooks, big thousand page jobs, and lectured to doctors many times at their continuing education uh, meetings. And I was not successful in getting people who are in a position of authority, either in medical research or the government, 
to get excited about preventing and curing diseases in people with nutrition like we did in animals. And I knew this was an important concept back in the 60s, and that's why I went back to school, became a physician. Well, this came out just about 40 years later. This is a World Health Organization study. Nutrition, key factor in mortality. Study finds life expectancy closely mirrors dietary factors. Well, look at there, okay? And the most important sentence they had in the whole article was, it says, inadequate intake of three key micronutrients, zinc, iron, and vitamin A, is responsible for an unexpectedly high burden of, of disease. Well, there's 90 essential nutrients. They, they didn't talk about the other 87. They just talked about three. Vitamins could help two billion kids. This just came out in March of 2004, a couple of months ago. Vitamins could help two billion kids. How many people are there on Earth? Six billion. That's a third of the population. Any doctor, anybody who says that, you know, there's no evidence to support a claim that you can prevent and cure diseases with vitamins and minerals is a fool. Um, how many of you have ever heard of scurvy? Raise your hand. You know, you can prevent and cure scurvy with vitamin C. How many of you have heard of rickets? You can prevent and cure rickets with vitamin D. What about anemia? You can prevent and cure anemia with iron and copper and folic acid and B12 and many other nutrients. What about goiter? You can prevent and cure goiter with iodine and copper and selenium and, and tyrosine and amino acid. Uh, what about things like oh, osteoporosis? You can actually prevent and cure that with, with calcium and magnesium and sulfur and many other uh, nutrients. And what about uh, diseases like night blindness? You can prevent and cure night blindness with vitamin A. And then there's beriberi with congestive heart failure. You can prevent and cure that with thiamine or vitamin B1. And, and then there's a plague with the schizophrenia and all the dermatitis and diarrhea that goes along with that. You can prevent and cure that with niacin or vitamin B3. And I could go through all the 90 essential nutrients because they're called essential nutrients for two reasons. Number one, our bodies cannot manufacture them. We must consume them every day, either as food or as supplements. And number two, if any of them are missing, you get some horrible collection of degenerative diseases, many of which are life-threatening. And so anybody who says there's no evidence to support a claim that you can prevent and cure disease with vitamins and minerals is a fool. And the last place you want to fool in your life is your doctor. If you have a doctor who believes that, I'd get up and leave. I would not go back to them because you don't want anybody that ignorant in charge of your health. Because, well, my doctor says I can just eat well and get everything I need. Well, that was never true, but, you know, why do people in Ethiopia live to be an average of 29 and we live to be an average of 70-something? Is it genetic? No. It's because they don't have a lot of minerals in their soil. Sand. Let's just look. Uh, this is actually a study from, uh, just came out this month. It's the June-July uh, 2004 issue of Mother Earth. And it was actually what they did was take a USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, study where they compared the 1975 to 2004 values in food. And when you look at just wheat, for instance, the calcium content in wheat went down 22% during that time period. Uh, when you look at, oh, let's look at another mineral, potassium went down 6%. Phosphorus went down 24%. Then you look at calcium in apples, went down 14%. In blueberries, it went down 60%. In onions, it went down 18%. In green beans, it went down 33%. In broccoli, it went down 54%. Wait a minute, you're supposed to eat broccoli. Eat three servings of broccoli a day. Eat five pounds of broccoli a day. You get all the calcium you need. So it went down 54%. That means you need to eat seven and a half pounds of broccoli a day to get your calcium. Yay, man, that's exciting. Eat seven and a half pounds of broccoli. I mean, you're going to generate enough gas to run a turbine. You, know? <laughs> you look at iron here. Let's look at iron and apples. It went down 60% in that same time period. In blueberries, it went down 72%. In onions, it went down 62%. Uh, let's see here. Oh, in carrots, it went down 57%. In broccoli, it went down 33%. Let's look at vitamin A. Now, the vitamin A is interesting because it's a carbon compound that plants can make if they have all the nutrition they need. They have, still, they have to have mineral cofactors to be able to make the carbon compounds, right? So let's look at vitamin A. Apples went down 40% in that time period. Uh, blueberries went down 40%. Onions went down 95%. Uh, tomatoes went down 31%. Corn went down 400%. Well, I'm eating plenty of corn, so I'm, I'm getting all the beta carotene I need. Went down 400%. I'm eating cornbread. I'm getting all the beta carotene I need. Broccoli went down 74%. Vitamin C, legendary, made by plants. Blueberries went down 31%. Uh, onions went down 36%. Spinach went down 45%. They actually checked 12 different nutrients, and they just get a little summary here. One other thing I think was important in this article. In 1992, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, came out and said, if everybody just took the minimum daily requirement of all the known essential nutrients, they were going to reduce the actual reporting level of cancer by 20%, you can reduce cardiovascular disease in America by 25%, reduce arthritis by 50%, reduce 
reduce respiratory infectious disease by 20% and reduce infant and maternal deaths by 50%. If, you just, if everybody, everybody just took the vitamins and minerals. But doctors today still say, medical doctors still today say, you can get everything you need by eating your basic four food groups. Just eat variety. Have three different colors on your plate and, and you'll do fine. Well, doctors should be put in jail for 25 years to life because it's reckless endangerment. Through their ignorant pontifications, they have killed more people in all the wars the world put together. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. This just came out June 16th, 2004. UN warns one-third of the earth is at risk of becoming a desert. Can you grow good food in the desert? I don't think so. This is a creeping catastrophe. And we're talking about in the United States, we're talking about losing at least uh, one-third of the land that we can grow food on now. There's just no nutrition left in the soil. And so how do we protect people? Uh, just eat better? Eat more broccoli? Well, that's not it. That's, that's not going to work, folks. The only way you can make sure you're getting all these nutrients is to consciously put them in your mouth. You have to supplement. Well, despite kind of a tragic outlook here, there are people who do make it to 100. Percentage-wise, it's very small in the United States. We're the third largest population in the world. But there are people who live long, healthy lives. And again, they tend to be rebellious patients who don't listen to their doctors. They do things that doctors don't want them to do. And they're the ones who make it to 100. And the ones who follow their doctor's instructions exactly don't make it. How many of you had somebody in your family who lived to be 80, 90 years of age? I think most Americans have had somebody, unless they're all horse thieves and got hung early. But, you know, most people have somebody 80, 90 in their family. You can remember back, they'd eat eggs every morning. They'd salt their food. They'd eat red meat. They ate their chicken skin. Uh, they used butter. They didn't even have margarine back in those days. And the only exercise they did when they came home from a hard day's work was to fall asleep on the floor in their bib overalls. They didn't even have a lazy boy chair to sleep in. So let's see some of these rebellious people. Ralph Charles from Somerset, Ohio, which is in the middle of the state of Ohio, back in uh, October of 1999, turned 100. And the fascinating thing to me about Ralph Charles was that he was still, at his birthday at 100, was still piloting commercial charter flights, carrying, paying passengers around the central part of the United States. To me, he doesn't look like what you expect a decrepit 100-year-old to look like. To me, he looks like he's in his maybe late 70s, early 80s. Had no restrictions on his pilot's license or health papers at 100. And then this gal here, Connie Douglas Reeves, four days after this article came out, September 26, 2002, she turned 101 and she was entered into the Cowgirl Hall of Fame because she'd taught 30,000 young women how to ride western saddles and, and barrel race. And to me, she doesn't look like a shrinking violet. She doesn't look like somebody who would say, well, whatever you say, doctor, I mean, after all, you're the one with the white coat and the stethoscope around your neck, so I'm here for your advice, and if that's what you say, I'll do it. You know, she's got her shoulders back, her chin's out, and she's just saying, you know, knock that chip off. I mean, anybody who deals with horses for 101 years that she's been rolled on, kicked, thrown, bit, stomped, and she's standing straight and tall, and you can just imagine a doctor saying to her, Connie, you're 101 years old now. I want you to give up salt. We've got to worry about your blood pressure. And she says, well, up yours, doc. I've been using salt since before you were born. I'm not going to quit now. You've got to give up eggs. We've got to worry about your cholesterol. She goes, Pfft. okay, I've been eating eggs forever, and I'm not going to give them up. Well, if she's a little rough for you, you might appreciate Harold Stilson from Deerfield Beach, Florida. In May of 2001, he turned 101 and went out and played golf for his birthday, and he hit a six hole in one at 101. Now, you have to have good vision to be able to see that little stick 108 yards away. You have to have a good grip on that club, and you have to have good eye-hand coordination to hit that ball, right? Tiger Wood can't even hit a hole-in-one anymore. I mean, he's, about, he's done since he let him do that arthroscopic surgery on his knee and get that radial keratotomy. I mean, he hasn't won a match since he had those two surgeries. He should sue his doctors, whoever talked him into that. I was just in Puerto Rico with my dear wife and a uh, training thing, and this gal here, her name was... Ramona Trinidad Inglesias Jordan, and she turned 100. She actually died at 114. She was the oldest living, I guess you'd call her an American, you know, American territory kind of thing, 114. And uh, she looks pretty good for 114. She looks like she's 80 years old. And she lived up in the mountains in the, in the rainforest of Puerto Rico. Never been to a doctor. And they're kind of bragging about that in the newspaper. It doesn't seem to matter what you eat as long as you keep the minerals up and the carbohydrate calories down. This gal here, Dora Ramathebe from South Africa, was born in June of 1881. Uh, and I don't know how long she lived because this is a birthday announcement. Didn't keep track of her. Uh, turned 114 in 1995. And when she was asked, Dora, what do you attribute your health and your longevity to? She didn't say I was born in Scripps Hospital. She was born in a straw hut caulked with cow dung. 
Her mama peed in the dust to make mud to smear all over that child to keep the flies from eating her. How do I know that? Because I lived in South Africa for two years and attended many births, even as a veterinarian, because I was the only medical person around. And guess what? That's what they do. Uh, she didn't say, I kept my cholesterol down and gave up salt and went to my annual physical. You think she did all that living out in the bush in Africa 114 years ago? No. Uh, she ate locusts, you know, grasshoppers, not the tree. Pumpkin seeds, tortoise meat, wild herbs, dried fruit, and a cup of coffee. Did she say rice, bread, potatoes, corn? No. She had a very low carbohydrate diet. The only carbohydrate she took in was a little bit of dried fruit, and they don't get much of that out in the middle of the bush of Africa. That's kind of a special thing people give to each other there. Had a very low carbohydrate diet. Had some essential fatty acids from the, from the pumpkin seeds, and she got some protein from the grasshoppers and the tortoise meat. She may have gotten some vitamin C and folic acid and beta carotene from the herbs if she ate them raw when they picked them for maybe green vegetables. Well, guess what they do in Africa? I kind of gave you a hint earlier on. Every morning they take the wood ashes from their heating and cooking fires and they put them in their gardens where they grow their squash and cucumbers and carrots and tomatoes and cabbage. So recycling minerals, low carbohydrate diet. Did she have access to vaccinations and penicillin and all that stuff and great doctors from Harvard Medical School and Mayo Clinic? No. Living out in the bush, couldn't read, couldn't even get an Advil. One of my favorite birth announcements is a French lady uh, by the name of Jean Calment. Um, in February of 1995, she was documented by the Guinness World Book of Records being the oldest living woman at that time. There were hundreds of women who claimed to be older than she, but she was the only one that had the paperwork to prove to the satisfaction of the Guinness World Book of Records that February 21st, 1995, she was, in fact, 120. February 21st, 1996, she turned 120. One. February 21st, 1997, she turned 122, and she died in August of 1997, at age 122 years and 164 days. She was 122 and a half when she died. She died suddenly of a stroke. She was up singing Ferrajaka, for God's sakes. Ferrajaka, Ferrajaka, cooking her eggs. Whoa! Fell over dead. That was it. No nursing home. I mean, nothing. No cancer, no heart disease, uh, no Alzheimer's disease. She was bright and mentally alert until the day she died. No diabetes. This came out. In uh, October, when I was in Adelaide, Australia, this is an Adelaide, Australia newspaper, they have a lot of stuff from Southeast Asia, as you can imagine. Uh, this guy here, a um, uh, tiger hunter, a Cambodian tiger hunter, said to be the world's oldest man, has died at age 122. Sek Yi, who is also a martial arts expert, attributed his longevity and that of his wife, Long Uk, 108, to smoking and prayer. Well, I can go for the prayer part, Pastor Joe, but I want to know what he was smoking and if he inhaled. There's also a Sydney, Australia newspaper, also in 2003, a Brazilian believed to be the world's oldest woman has died at age 124. Maria Etolavina dos Santos died of a stroke in Salvador. Her birth certificate said she was a descendant of African slaves born in June of 1878. Was she born in Scripps Hospital? Did she have vaccinations and penicillin? Uh, no, she was born in a straw hut caulked with mud. And since her parents came from Africa, her mama peed in the dust to make mud to smear all over that child to keep the flies and mosquitoes from eating her. Turned out to be the old, how many people in San Diego have lived to be 124? Here's a gal who made it to 120. I don't know if she's still alive, maybe. She's a gal by the name of Elizabeth Israel. And um, this was back in January of 2001. She was born in 1875. She was born in the Caribbean on the island of Dominica, according to her birth and baptismal records. Well, how do these old people have so many birth records? That's because the Spanish set all that stuff up in 1541. They set up a birth certificate system. Anybody who is involved in the Spanish churches got a birth certificate. Uh, here in the United States, they say, well, yeah, so-and-so claims to be 130 years old, but they don't have a birth certificate. That's because they were born in you know, 1905, and they still weren't issuing birth certificates in Beanbag, Iowa, right? Okay, one last one. I think you'll get the message here, and then we'll move on to the meat of this thing. This gal here, uh, Mizumi Dusty from Iran, uh, back in January of 1995, and this, uh, her obituary is published in the Rocky Mountain News out of um, Denver, Colorado, said that she died at age 161. That seems pretty outrageous, but you have to actually give some credibility to this obituary because she was survived by six living children ranging in age from 120 to 128, and none of them had left home to go to college yet. They were still babies. Her oldest son said his mother had never visited a doctor. She never took any prescription medications. She only used herbs during her life. There's messages all over these birthday announcements and obituaries, ladies and gentlemen. None of them are just swooning over their cholesterol-lowering statin drugs. None of them are swooning over eating egg beaters. These are all primitive people. 
There's clues here. But what do primitive people do every morning? They take the wood ashes from their cooking and heating fires and they put them in their gardens. We have electric stoves. And so how do you replace what we gave up for the convenience of a modern kitchen? You have to consciously supplement and put them in your mouth. If you don't do that, you're doomed to suffer all the terrible diseases you can suffer from. Now, geneticists tell us we can live to be well beyond 100. We have the genetics. I don't care if everybody in your family died at 35. Everybody in this room has the genetics to live well beyond 100. And the short version of why we don't is because we do too many bad things and not enough of the good things. I mean, that's the shortest way I can say it. It's always amazing to me why people go to medical doctors for advice on health and longevity. I have to ask my doctor. I just hear that so many times I want to choke people. In my tape, Dead Doctors Don't Lie, I said the average medical doctor lives to be 58. And medical doctors, I mean, they just got so hysterically angry with me. You can't believe how angry they got with me with that. I mean, they called me every kind of name you could call a, another human being <laughs> and uh, reported me to every agency they could think of, and some they made up. And they, they didn't want to believe me, which I did a survey. I took all these obituaries and medical journals and added them up the ages and divided by the number of doctors, got a simple average and said doctors live to be 57.6. I rounded up to 58, gave them the benefit of the doubt, and they did their own study. Came out three years later in 1999, so Wallach was wrong. The average doctor doesn't live to be 58, they live to be 56. Wallach was a liar. And so why do we go to medical doctors for advice on health and longevity? When they only live to be 56, I mean, it's outrageous. I mean, you wouldn't do that in any other industry. Why would you go to Mr. Goodwrench to have your car maintained if, if the word got out that his cars that he maintained only went 5,000 miles? Or they burned up. The reason is twofold. I pondered on this a long time. They have convinced everybody they're the go-to people. I mean, you can't even put on a Band-Aid without asking your doctor. I mean, where are the medical doctors? I mean, we have to get everybody to fight for insurance, right? Because you, you, there's 30 million people in America without health insurance. I mean, the country's doomed without health insurance. Secondly, they've been able to relegate all other health practices, even 10,000-year-old ones like Ayurvedic medicine from India and, and traditional Chinese medicine, they've been able to relegate them to quackery. They've been able to convince the government that they're the go-to people. Chiropractors and naturopaths, acupuncturists, Ayurvedic medical practitioners, these guys are all quacks. Insurance can't pay quacks. If a patient goes to them, we've got to put them in jail for practicing medicine without a license. They have politically and financially been able to kill their competition. Now, the Sherman Antitrust Act was actually um, put into law in 1895. Any industry that does that gets knocked down. Ma Bell tried it, and they broke them up. Why doesn't the government break up the medical profession? I'm going to show you why in a second. It's pretty scary. Well, if we're getting our, our money's worth, you might be able to say, well, they're crooks and scoundrels and all that kind of stuff, but... But because we're getting our money's worth, it might be okay. Let's see if we're getting our money's worth. First of all, each year the entire world spends $2.7 trillion, that's with a T, $2.7 trillion for health care. <laughs> that's a gob of money, $2.7 trillion for health care. Now that $2.7 trillion, the United States alone each year spends $1.6 trillion, more than half. So we better rank pretty high since we're spending more than half. We're spending more money for health care than all the other nations in the world put together. So let's just see where we rank. In April of 1990, I found the first public printing of where we rank. This was a World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control uh, out of Atlanta, Georgia, came together and they came up with this survey. They said, out of the top 32 industrialized nations, the United States ranked 17th. In April of 1990, there were 16 other countries whose peoples were healthier than we were and lived longer than we did. And yet we spend more money for health care than all of them put together. The entire world. And we ranked 17th. Japanese ranked number one, 79.1. You say, well, that was a bad study. Let's redo it. Well, they did 10 years later, June 2000, they redid it. Japan maintained number one, but they dropped from 79.1 down to 74.5. So this is our chance to catch up and surpass them, at least gain on them, right? Instead, we dropped from 17th longevity all the way down to 24th. Now there's 23 other countries whose peoples live longer than we are and healthier than we are, and yet we spend more money for health care than all the other countries in the world. Does that give you some sense that we're going the right direction? Well, it doesn't me. I'm just a dumb farm boy from Missouri, but the numbers don't equate to being on the right track. That give you the sense that doctors are laying awake day and night trying to figure out how to cure us of all these terrible diseases? Doesn't me. What about all these 250,000 pharmaceuticals and prescription drugs they have in the PDR, physician's desk reference? If you take out the 500 antibiotics out of there, out of the 250,000 drugs, which are designed to cure infections, you know, like strep throat and scarlet fever and 
putting pneumonia and things like that. There's 249,500 pharmaceuticals left. And you can't find one of them that are designed to cure anything. They're all designed to milk the insurance system. There's no laws requiring pharmaceutical companies to make cures, and so they don't. There's no laws requiring medical doctors to cure people when their cure is available, so they don't. Now, that's a mind blower. There's no law requiring doctors to cure people when their cure is available, so they don't. Now, we would all like to think in our heart of hearts that doctors, medical doctors, are altruistic, and they're in the business of helping people. Well, if you believe that, you're living in la-la land. Their primary concern is not to help people. Their primary concern is to crack that financial nut every month. Health spending has hit the biggest surge in 11 years. It must be Bush's fault. God, it's Bush's fault. No. That started out 20 years ago when we came up with the um, managed care. How many heard of managed care? Now, managed care was designed to stop excessive tests and the unnecessary surgical procedures and unnecessary prescriptions by doctors. And it was working. But doctors' incomes got cut in half. I mean, their lifestyles were going in the tank. So they started whispering to their patients, look, there's some beady-eyed accountant kept you from getting that test. Now, I'm the doctor. I know you needed that test, and he won't let me do it. You've got to pay for it out of your own pocket. Oh, we can't have that. And so by continuing to whisper in the patient's ears after 10 or 11 years, patients finally kind of rose up, and Medicare had to back out of the managed care system. And the day after, the day after Medicare backed out of the controlled environment where the bean counter was in charge of what you got instead of the doctor, went up 17%. Healthcare went up 17%. It's been going up almost 50% every quarter now since then because they're totally unchecked. It's political suicide for anybody to try and stem the tide. Right now we're spending $1.6 trillion a year for healthcare. And I'm going to show you what to do about it. Age 65 workforce. Wait a minute, workforce? Age 60, you're supposed to retire at 65. What is this workforce thing? According to the U.S. Department of Labor, 95% of all Americans who retired 65 retire below the poverty level. $2,000 a month is poverty cutoff. 95% of Americans, after working 40 years in America, retire below poverty level. You have to do something else. You've got to go back to work because that 1200 bucks a month doesn't cut it. You've got to sell your house you paid on for 30 years to move into a scroungy little apartment because you can't afford the taxes every year. can't afford the utilities, the upkeep. What a, what a crummy deal. Well, whose fault is it? What's the most common thread that people complain about when they retire. Health care. Oh, uh, they testify before Congress. Uh, I couldn't eat lunch today because I, I had to pay for my drugs. Uh, I, I can't eat. I have to pay for my drugs. Well, why do you have to pay for your drugs? Because my doctor told me. And then this is the most outrageous thing I've ever seen. Last year, nine months ago, whatever it is, you may all remember this. Vaughn's and Ralph's and Kroger's. 70,000 workers from, from grocery stores went on strike in Southern California alone, and they were striking all over the country in sympathy with them because over a three-year period between 2000 and 2003, the health care cost for their insurance went up 50%, went up from $6,000 a year to $9,000 a year, and the contract said that the, the store chains were going to pay for their health care. And so these people struck the stores, I don't know, three months, four months, whatever it was, a lot of them closed their doors and went out of business. When they did come back, all their customers had started going to Costco's. A lot cheaper. And so a lot of them are still not open 24 hours like they used to be because they don't have any business anymore. That strike killed the jobs for these 70,000 people. Now, they're striking the wrong person. Why would they strike the company that's paying their mortgage and paying the food for their kids and paying for their car payment? They should have been striking the doctors. They should have been striking the insurance companies. They should have been striking the hospitals and clinics. I mean, the doctors are really smart. They're sitting there playing cards in the in their country club. <laughs> well, we got, we got this army, all these union guys out there striking them. Somebody's going to pay us. We'll get the government to do it, the company. We don't care if they all go bankrupt and lose their job. They're going to pay us. So I'm getting close to telling you what, what we do to solve this problem. I, I gave you kind of a hint there. What do you do with a failed and corrupt system? Do you keep feeding it more money? Oh, well, the mafia, we got to pay them more money. Now, they'll be good to us if we just pay them more money. Outsourcing the American dream. Have we lost a few jobs in Southern California? Whoa! They're going to India faster than you can name them. Telephone operators in the United States average $12.50 an hour plus health benefits. In India, they make less than a dollar an hour and no health benefits. Payroll clerks in Asia make less than $2 an hour, no health benefits. Their counterparts in the U.S. make $15.17 an hour plus health benefits. And so when the health care goes up and the union demands more money to pay the health care, guess what the company says? 
Adios amigo. Close the door and they're off to India. You can't blame those companies. I mean, they're working on 1% margins of profit. They got to worry about their stockholders. And so if you push too much, it's like the old pinball machine. Some of you old remember the old pinball machines before computers? You had 1,800 points left before you could win a free game. And you started pushing that thing too hard to keep that ball up there. What happened? Tilt! Game over. I hated to see that. Game over, game over, game over. Well, that's what happens when you push the employers too much now. They have other options. They can just close their doors and go to India. You know, with today's electronics, three rings. And they say, howdy, how can I help you? And you think you've called Texas. You just hit New Delhi. To kind of tell you where, you know, spiritually medical doctors come from. But they're not going to treat lawyers and their families who sue them for malpractice. And so when that came out, I sent out a news release. Nobody picked it up. I didn't think they would, but I felt better. I sent out a news release and said, I'll waive my professional fees. I will treat any lawyer who sues doctors. For malpractice. I will waive my professional fees. Didn't get published anywhere, but I felt good because I sent it out. <laughs> doctors said he'd lie to get insurers to pay. 58% of doctors admitted in a survey that was published by the American Medical Association, 58% admitted they would lie to get paid for procedures they didn't even do. They admitted they would lie to get paid for procedures that they did do that the patient didn't need. Now, doctors are the only people who don't have to go to a, a bank when they need money. At the end of the month, if they need $10,000 because they went to Vegas and they lost $10,000 and they can't pay their mortgage, and you're the last patient of the month, you're going to get everything known to medical science. They just send in that bill to Medicare and they get 10000 bucks in their account the next day and they pay their bills and everybody's happy. According to the Health Insurance Association of America, 75% of insurance fraud is committed by providers, which is a code word for doctors. 75% of all health insurance fraud is committed by medical doctors. You know how many medical doctors go to jail for that each year? Zero. They are dealt with by another standard. If you and I were to somehow try to defraud an insurance company, they would hire detectives and they would hunt you down forever and get you in jail. The medical doctors do it with impunity. Health insurance companies write it off as a cost of doing business. And guess who picks up the difference? Look in the mirror sometime. You're the one picking up the difference. So we should be striking them. We have a history in America of doing that kind of stuff. We have a history of rebellion. I don't suggest you pick up rifles and go shoot doctors, although sometimes I feel like it, but what I'm suggesting is this. Let's do what we've done in other industries. You know, 60 years ago, when the automobile industry began to crank down on people, look, you're driving a Ford car, you've got to come to a Ford dealer. We're the only go-to people for a Ford car. And you go in for a $6 oil change 60 years ago, and they say, look, uh, yeah, you've had this 25,000 miles. Why don't you let us do a check on it, and we'll do whatever's necessary. And you've been driving. You said, nothing wrong with it. Sure, go ahead and do a check. You come back, it's a $300 bill. You say, what? It was supposed to be 6 bucks. Well, you told us to check it out. You gave us permission to do that. It's 300 bucks because we rebuilt the transmission. We did the carburetor, uh, all new brake shoes, blah, 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 300 bucks. And they wouldn't give you the key until you paid your 300 bucks. But you didn't go back because you demanded, you know, some um, redress uh, from the uh, manager. And he said, well, no, we did the work. you got to give me the money before we give you the keys. And so people started going to junkyards and garage sales and, and flea markets. They read books on how to maintain their own cars and change their own oil and do all that kind of stuff. They stop even thinking about going to the dealerships. And when the junkyards and the flea markets and the garage sales couldn't support the demand for parts and tools anymore, a whole industry developed. Now we have Nap Auto Parts and Pet Boys and AutoZone. We have all these uh, Jiffy Lubes all over the place. They only sprang up because people wanted to do things themselves and they were tired of being ripped off by the dealerships. Same thing happened in the construction industry. Same thing happened in the remodeling industry and in the landscaping industry. When they got a little oppressive to the customers, people started going to garage sales and they went to flea markets and they'd go to junkyards to find parts. I mean, plumbers were charging $200 to change a float in a toilet for little old people. And the, the, the worst nightmare is, of course, the, the one that people hated were roofs. Somehow, roofing companies, you'd sign a contract for a $6,000 roof and if you didn't read the fine print, was revolving interest. If you didn't pay it off in a year, it was $100,000, right? People started going to garage sales and, and junkyards and flea markets, getting materials and tools to maintain and repair their own homes. Some of you are old enough to remember back in the 60s, everybody had a tool shop in their own garage. I mean, I had them uh, back then. We had a table saw and a band saw, and you had all the drills. That's when this home thing started back in the 60s and 70s. And when the garage sales and the flea markets and the junkyards couldn't supply the demand for tools and materials anymore, a whole industry developed to supply the demand. Now we have Home Depot and Lowe's and Menards. 
If you want to find out where everybody's at this afternoon, go out to the parking lot at Home Depot. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock after church, go there. Parking lot, you can't find a parking space in Home Depot in Lowe's and Menards because people are out there doing it themselves. And so there's clues here on how to deal with an oppressive, failed, corrupt industry. Stop using them. But you just can't jump from the frying pan into the fire. You have to educate yourself. We have all these books. Let's play doctor. Let's play herbal doctor. Rare herbs have been cures. Dead doctors don't lie. I mean, we're talking about $50, $60 worth of books. Teach you how to deal with over 900 different diseases using herbs and vitamins and minerals and amino acids and fatty acids. We're talking about stuff that works. I already had three people today. I walked in the door, just met them. I met lots of people, but these three people came up and told me how, how the products were working for them. They were just so surprised and happy how well they're doing on, on just taking vitamins and minerals. And they've been going to doctors for years and couldn't solve their problems. Before I came here, people were calling me from Atlanta, Georgia, and from Portland, Oregon, dealing with problems because they've given up on their doctors. And so right now we have baby boomers coming along. There's 80 million baby boomers in the United States alone, 80 million, who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. They're, they're sick of being ripped off by the medical system. They're trying. They're getting the gut. You know, they want the government to solve the problem. Well, the medical industry generates taxes from $1.6 trillion a year. The military-industrial complex, which the hippies were so worried about during the 60s and 70s, only generates $400 billion, one-fourth of what the medical system. Who has the most power, military-industrial complex or the medical system? Clinton tried in his first term, in the first year of his first term, to deal with the medical situation, and they chewed him up. The office of the president, with all the power and prestige and all the departments and money available to the president to solve a problem, it only got worse. They just snubbed their nose at him, not because they were Republicans, but because they weren't going to let the President of the United States interfere with their, their cash flow. And so we have to do this because nobody else is going to do it. First thing I want to talk about is exercise. Would you believe it or not, how many of you heard that exercise is good for you? If you don't raise your hand, you're a liar, a communist, or you're asleep already because I know that you've all heard that, right? Well, this is me when I was 18 years old. Look familiar? Didn't have a gram of fat on me. I was mean as a burnt bear, and I, I, I was tough. I was like a rock, and I could do anything. I knew it because I knew it. And I could, in addition to farm work, I'd spend a lot of time during school when everybody else was eating lunch. I was running up and down the stadium stairs. I was weightlifting. I was punching the bag. I was doing everything I could to get tough and, and so I could play sports, and I did. And then I read an article that said there would never been a professional athlete ever lived to be 100, so I stopped exercising. Because if exercise is good for you, there should be a significant percentage of professional athletes live to be 100 because they get paid to do it and they're not likely to slough off. And this is a little chart out of God Bless America. It talks about some of the more famous athletes that died of nutritional deficiency diseases. Uh, the oldest one was Red Grange, died at 88. Now you know, Red Grange died a long time ago, right? And then, let's see, Jesse Owens died at 66. Jim Thorpe died at 65. Babe Ruth died at 53. Lou Gehrig died at 38. Wilma Rudolph, four gold medals in track, uh, died at 54. Babe Zaharias, one of the greatest female athletes ever, died at 43. Jim Fix, who invented the fitness concept in America, died at 52. Hank Gathers, a great basketball player, died at 23. Wilt Chamberlain died at 63. Reggie Lewis died at 27. Walter Payton died at 45. Sergey Grinkoff, one of the icons of, of figure skating, died at age 28. Flojo uh, died at 35. I don't believe a seizure killed her. I think something else killed her. Don Drysdale died of a heart attack. Great baseball player at 56. Corey Stringer, a football player, died of heat stroke at age 27. And according to... The Center for Disease Control of Atlanta, Georgia, each year in America, somewhere between 75,000 and 100,000 Americans under the age of 30 drop dead while they're exercising. Car accidents only claim 57,000. Of those 57,000, 17,000 are killed by drunk drivers. Look at all the hoo-ha we have about accidents in cars. And doctors are instructing people to exercise. You know, it kills more people in car accidents. It doesn't start out you're healthy and you die. How many of you are boxing fans? Anybody here a boxing fan? Okay, if you remember Roberto Duran, no mas, no mas. And this is about 10 years ago, I think, somewhere around there, 10, 12 years ago. Not a championship, but 100 fights, many championship fights. Um, he was in a championship 12-round fight with Sugar Ray Leonard. I think it was in the second round, third round, something real early. He just got up and said, I don't want to do this anymore. They spent millions and millions of dollars in advertisements, Caesars Palace in Vegas. I mean, there were, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars worth of bets, and he just said, that's it, no mas, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like boxing anymore. It's a cruel sport. <laughs> Elite athletes face this hazard. I already talked about this guy. Vans Fred. And he barely made the cut on this uh, latest by two by two strokes. I mean, they were sweating. 
him even getting in. He's he's going down, folks. I just spent a weekend with these guys, with Ted and Angela. Talk about talent. These guys had all the talent in the world when it came to basketball, and they still lost. They got beat by the punk team. You think they lost because they didn't have talent? You think they lost because they didn't want to win? You think they lost because they didn't practice? If you look historically at this situation, it happens a lot where they draft some big stars and then it didn't work. You know, here's a whole bunch of teams that hire these big stars at the beginning of a season to try and make something happen. It didn't happen. That's a little picture of Theo Ratliff from his own website. Theo Ratliff's a very interesting guy. In 2000-2001, um, he missed 79 games. His career was over. He had the best orthopedic surgeons telling him his career was over. His right shooting wrist turned into dust. There was nothing bigger than a BB in there. I mean, none of his bones were in any shape. They couldn't even put wires or nothing in there. He had the cartilage came loose in his hip. They had to go in and do a hip surgery. His other hip was just as bad. Bone to bone arthritis in both knees. He was only 28 years old. His career was over. And he happened to hear some of our distributors talking to another player in the locker room. He says, hey, you think that stuff will help me? In three months' time, all his pain went away and his range of motion came back. Three more months, he felt so good, he tried back out for the team and he got his old position back. This guy, who six months earlier was told that his career was over. He had all these terrible degenerative problems, his career was over. Well, the last two years, he's been the shot-blocking champion, the super, super defensive star in the NBA, and that's impossible. All his orthopedic surgeons said so. Well, we put him back together just using vitamins and minerals and trace minerals and rare earths and amino acids and fatty acids. So I'm going through a progression here. You've gone through the emotional failures, physical failures, Remember I told you Jim Fix was a guy who started during the 1970s. He started the whole fitness thing. Up until Jim Fix in the 1970s, nobody but people who played team sports worked out. The average housewife didn't go in for aerobics and yoga. The average, you know, Joe Carpenter, you know, the average working man didn't work out. Came home and drank a beer and passed gas and watched TV. That was his life. His great excitement was if he, you know, won a case of beer at bingo. Jim Fix came along and said, hey, if you run 10 miles a week, We'll keep your arteries clean and, and you don't have to die until you're 100. And he personally, consciously, in all his writings, stayed away from vitamins and minerals because when he lived to be 100, he did not want anybody to say, well, how do you know, Jim, it wasn't the vitamins and minerals? He wouldn't even eat rich bread. And he died at 52 of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple deficiency of the trace mineral selenium. Well, this fellow here, Brian Maxwell, was one of his protégés. He believed in Jim Fix like you, you just have no idea how much he thought of Jim Fix. He thought he was like another father to him. He invented the power bar. There was no such thing as a granola bar until Brian Maxwell. He invented them in 1983. Actually, it was his girlfriend who was a nutritionist because they kept hitting the wall in their marathons. They'd, at about mile 18, they'd hit this wall and they'd have to walk. No matter how well they were trained, they just couldn't go anymore. And he was the one who invented the carb up thing. And I eat spaghetti before the big race. Like, That's this guy that came up with that. He just died in March of a heart attack, cardiomyopathy heart attack at age 51. He'd won 14 world-level marathons in the Olympics, World Games, international marathon, 14 of them. He placed in the top five in 100 of them in his lifetime. And he died at age 51 of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple deficiency of selenium. And so when he died, we got on the computer and we looked up the analysis of power bars. There's just nothing but grains and some honey and sugar and stuff like that. It's an energy bar, it's a power bar, energy bar. No selenium. Okay, one more clue. Well, two more clues. This is a small study, only 158 sudden deaths of young athletes. This is from 12 to 40. And of the 158 sudden deaths, 48 of them were in basketball. Only one was in boxing. Isn't boxing a more dangerous sport than basketball? Not according to this. 48 of the 158 that died in this little study were basketball players. How many of you ever been to a professional basketball game? Well, if you've never been to a professional basketball game or even a college basketball game, they have a team of people with towels. And during the free throws and the timeouts, what do they do? They're out there wiping the sweat off the floor so the players don't slip when they get under the basket and all that traffic is going in the basket. They're out there wiping that sweat out from underneath the basket. That's another little clue. June 9th, this gal here, uh, Rolanda Pierce, 19 years old, six foot five, Florida State University. She was going to be the big savior of women's professional basketball when she graduated from college. I mean, she was the big up and comer. She died of a ruptured aneurysm at age 19. Ruptured aortic aneurysm. A copper deficiency. I mean, we eliminated ruptured aneurysms in turkeys in the 1950s. She died of something that even a turkey wouldn't die from. I guarantee you, she had the finest 
sports medical doctors. She had the finest trainers the money could pay for. But she died of something that a turkey wouldn't die from. Because I guarantee you she was just living on Coca-Cola's and curly french fries. Doesn't seem to matter what sport it is. Gray Lundy from Newport Beach, California, died at 14 of a cardiomyopathy heart attack, training for water polo. This gal here, Helen Moros, the top runner, smoke-free, top marathon runner in Australia, died at 35 of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. Does she look healthy to you? She looks like an escapee from a death camp in Germany to me. I mean, look at her, look at her arms. I mean, she does not look like a healthy person. We talked about Sergey Grinkov, age 28, died of a cardiomyopathy heart attack. The darlings of the Paris figure skating world. One more, maybe two more, then I'll tell you why. Reggie Lewis. At 27, he collapsed with a cardiomyopathy heart attack. They diagnosed it correctly, cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple uh, deficiency of the trace mineral selenium. They got 12 cardiologists from around the world, the top 12 cardiologists from around the world, and they paid them a million dollars each to refer, this is the Celtics, they paid them a million dollars each to refer their patients out to other doctors so they could devote their full time to saving Reggie. He's their top financial player and they wanted to save him get him back in the game and they were arguing amongst themselves who's going to do the transplant who's going to give him a pacemaker could he play with a transplanted heart could he play with a pacemaker if they put him in the right position and all that kind of stuff and while they were arguing about this he dies three weeks later he dies second cardiomyopathy heart attack well if you wait long enough justice has a way of coming around right god works in mysterious ways the chief the captain of the dream team of cardiology the medical doctor who ran the boston marathon all the time he wasn't a, a couch potato he was the designated sports medical doctor for the people who ran the Boston Marathon. He taught cardiology at Harvard Medical School in Boston. One doctor, W. Thomas Nessa, a year and a half after Reggie died, at age 48, dies of the same thing. Dr. W. Thomas Nessa, a member of the dream team of cardiologists who treated the late... Bo I mean, I'd have been embarrassed if I was part of his family to put that in there. I mean, this guy's malignant dumb. Died Saturday in his home and, you know, prophetically, he lived in a town called Dedham age 48. Now, if your cardiologist dies of a heart attack at age 48, how much belief should you have in him? But people say, oh, isn't it terrible that Dr. Nessa died of a heart attack? And they'll keep following his advice. Now, if he was my cardiologist and died at age 48 of a heart attack, if he said no salt, I'd be taking the top off the salt shaker and guzzling salt. If he said no eggs, I'd eat 25 a day. If he said exercise was good for you, I'd lay there and I wouldn't even blink. I would not do anything that resembled exercise because I wouldn't want to get what he got. If that's what you get for following what he was saying, I wouldn't want to do it. Well, the hint is, of course, athletes sweat more in five years than couch potatoes do in 75 years. You know, there's more librarians live to be 100. There's never been a professional athlete ever lived to be 100. It's pretty scary. Now, when I showed that to these guys in, in uh, Vegas, I mean, they really got concerned. Also, carbonated drinks will increase your risk of osteoporosis and fractures by 500%. I stood up there on the stage and I told them if I was a trainer, if I was an owner, I would not even let my players in the same room with carbonated drinks. Because there are big problems. The reason why they fall out, joint problems, bone problems, ligament problems, cartilage problems. And they're sitting there guzzling all those carbonated drinks. Doctors lack proof that too much salt is unhealthful. This came out almost exactly seven years ago. This was presented at the annual meeting of the American Heart Association in Portland, Oregon. After years of telling healthy people that too much salt isn't good for them, researchers still don't have solid evidence to back up that claim. Now, what does a good farmer or rancher put out for his livestock? Salt block or salt lick, right? There's nobody out in the pasture telling a cow she's limited to one lick a day, is there? I refuse to believe my human patients were dumber than a cow. Now look, go ahead and salt your food to taste. Salt your body. Don't worry about it. Well, how do I know if I'm getting too much? Well, it won't taste good. That's a high-tech answer, right? If it tastes too salty, don't eat it. If it tastes good, eat it. That's very simple. Works like a charm. Salt has nothing to do with high blood pressure. Genetics has nothing to do with high blood pressure. None. Nothing. That's the first thing. Do you have anybody in your family with high blood pressure? Yes. Okay, you're going to get blood pressure medication. Well, I don't have high blood but it's in your family. Genetics has nothing to do with it. Salt has nothing to do with it. In fact, the government spent $30 million on what they call the Sodium Task Force. And this came out in 1997. On the bottom line, it said, the study found that people who limited their salt intake to 1,000 milligrams or 1 gram a day, which, which was what medical doctors recommend to you, the people who followed the doctor's instructions had six times more heart attacks, 600% more heart attacks than those who defied their doctors and ate double that amount of salt. It's a government study. They're trying to prove the salt was bad. You had to get rid of salt. They couldn't do it. It was not true. Salt is an essential nutrient. If you get too much, you won't like it. So what causes high blood pressure? High blood pressure 
is caused by a simple deficiency of a single nutrient. Now, we've eliminated that deficiency in animals. Pigs and horses and cows and canaries and parakeets and dogs and cats and salamanders and crickets can all get high blood pressure. But they don't get high blood pressure, not because they don't have the genetics to get it. They don't get high blood pressure because, remember I said we got these little pellets? Because we don't have insurance to pay for calcium channel blockers and beta blockers for dogs. And so we just put that little mineral and all its cofactors in those pellets called calcium. And you can drink 50 gallons of milk a day and you can't get enough calcium to lower your blood pressure. You can eat 25 pounds of cheese a day, you can't get enough calcium to lower your blood pressure. The only thing that will happen is you'll be so constipated you need a jackhammer to have a bowel movement. If you didn't have hemorrhoids, you're going to get them. And so as part of our basic program, the basic program with all the known essential nutrients to support maintenance and repair, it's a mindless thing. You don't have to, let's see, I need two of these and I got my ratios and oh, 40 bottles of this. And we've done it all for you. $100 billion worth of research. We put it in those bottles. Obesity, quickly, 62% of Americans are overweight, 40% are obese. And, you know, there's all these diets. There's the Adkins diet. There's the South Beach diet. There's the Zone diet. And all they do is parse words on percentages of low glycemic carbs and fat. And they're, you know, well, I, I like 20%. No, no, I like 22%. It's going off the stick. It's Nothing is touching it. Well, my wife and I are finishing up a book because we know the cause of obesity. I mean, veterinarians know the cause of this because when you put an animal into the feedlot, when you put a steer in the feedlot, what is your goal? Make them fat. Prime beef is fat. We know how to do it. We know the technology to do it. And when you reverse engineer it, you can make lean beef. Oh, I mean, that's mysterious. We've been doing this forever. So I got tired of just telling everybody. Goes in one ear and out the other. Some people listen, take the ferret fat pack, lose a few pounds, right? But there's a lot of technology in that ferret fat pack. It's just not another diet because it's been engineered to work based on what they taught me in four years in agricultural school and four years in veterinary school and 45 years of experience. When that book comes out, it's going to be a shocker to everybody because it's going to be so far different than what anybody else is doing because none of them have even come close to the cause of the problem. They're just trying to deal with the symptom, fat. The reason why people get fat again is because they haven't dealt with the basic systemic problem. Obesity on track is number one preventable killer. Oh, that's important. Well, here's the secret of obesity. If you recognize what's going on in that picture, there's a work wagon of a little Amish farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Intercourse, Pennsylvania. That's off a little Amish farm. And I walked onto the farm and I said, what do you feed your horses? Oh, we just give them ground corn and whatever they can get out of the pasture, a little bit of hay. Well, you got a problem. He said, yeah, they get lame all the time. I want you to look at that wagon. You see anything wrong with that wagon? Yeah, I heard him say chewed up. That's right. Those horses have chewed that plank out of that wagon. That's where the farmer would jump off that wagon all the time with a sweaty hand, impregnated that wood with salt. Now, why were those horses chewing on that salty wood? Because they're minerally deficient. It's called pica. How many of you have heard of the term pica? Pregnant women do that all the time. They'll eat dirt. That's so common in the south part of the United States. They actually sell clay in little bags. You can get white clay, blue clay, red clay, yellow clay. They sell it in the grocery stores because people, women, pregnant women have cravings. How many of you have heard of pregnant women getting cravings? Okay, any woman who's ever been pregnant has a craving, right? That's because the baby is stealing minerals from the mother and she's not taking them in fast enough to replace what the baby's stealing from her. We've been taught that it's socially unacceptable to eat dirt and chew on the furniture, so we eat snacks. If you're that hungry and you're eating dirt, or you know, you're eating dirt as a kid, bam, don't do that. You'll embarrass me. If you're that hungry, go in there and eat a moon pie and a RC. Get them potato chips. Now, this is not a secret. The snack food industry knows about all this stuff. They engineer their food. The motto of Lay's potato chips is what? They're written right on the bag. You can't just eat one. Because they engineer it. When you open that bag, you're going to eat the entire bag and you're going to look for a second bag. It's engineered for that. It's not a mystery. And so, if every kid who had these cravings, you all know them, during, especially during a holiday. You've just eaten a seven-course dinner and you open up that refrigerator and you're standing there staring in there. What are you doing, Frank? I gave you a seven-course dinner for Christmas. You're just staring in the refrigerator. I don't know. I just need something. I don't know what it is. I'm just looking for something. Because calories don't solve the problems of a mineral deficiency. When you take minerals, you're not really hungry anymore. And so it's really easy to cut back on the food because you're not hungry anymore. i just show you two gals. This gal's from um, Nashville, Tennessee, Ann Halsenbach. Lost 90 pounds, 11 months. Good-looking lady. She did great. And I like this little gal, Terry Mooney from Fenton, Michigan. Lost 60 pounds in an eight-month period. She went from this, kind of like a, I'd say a farm wife kind of look, 
to this same girl. She's only 25 years old, but she looked like she's 40 years old, farm wife. Look at her now. And so we have thousands of people, both men and women, who've lost a lot of weight. Diabetes is an epidemic. Diabetes is an epidemic. It kind of goes along with this obesity thing. A million new cases a year in the United States alone makes up 12% of the American population, 32 million diabetics. Of them, 95% are 31 million are adult onset type 2 diabetics. And adult onset type 2 diabetics make tons of insulin. They make as much as 10 times more insulin than non-diabetics. It's not an insulin problem. They make more insulin. That's why they can take pills or maybe even with diet and exercise, they can kind of control their diabetes because they make plenty of insulin. We learned in 1957, when it was actually printed, published in medical journals in 1957, that we could prevent and cure. Those are two profound words. We could prevent and cure adult onset type diabetes in laboratory animals, pet animals, and farm animals in 1957 with two trace minerals and their cofactors. The medical doctors say, well, there's no evidence to support a claim that you can prevent and cure diabetes in human beings. And so it laid dormant in human medicine for 20 years until 1977. And then a, a guy who couldn't speak English very well, a medical doctor who couldn't speak English, who they put in charge of a coma center because he didn't have to talk to the patients, right? They're all in comas. <laughs> They put him in charge of a coma center, so all he had to do was read records. And he noticed that the people who survived three months in this coma center always got adult onset type 2 diabetes. 100% of them, after three months, 100%, regardless of their race, their age, their gender, nothing mattered. If they lived three months in that coma center, they got adult onset type 2 diabetes. They were waiting. They started testing them at about two and a half months. Sure enough, they'd always get diabetes by three months. They'd give them insulin. They'd control them. And he made the mental leap that there had to be something missing in the feeding tube that they were giving them because it didn't matter their age, their race, their gender, didn't matter anything. If they lived there three months in a coma, they got adult onset type. And so he made the correct thought that they were missing something. So he starts, starts reading. And sure enough, he goes back 20 years and he finds his research in animals. He says, well, that seems simple. He couldn't give them these alfalfa pellets with all these minerals in them because they're in a coma. And so he took that formula and made it into an IV, which he added to their basic feeding tube, and in 72 hours, he cured them all of their adult onset type of diabetes. Published in every medical journal in the world. This gets published every two or three years because people getting their PhD in endocrinology and they're studying diabetes, they run into that and they say, well, that can't be. So they try to redo it. And sure enough, it repeats. And so they publish it again. And so this is not a mystery. Every medical doctor knows this. They're not going to do that because they'll get 30 bucks for an extended visit. Well, according to the GAO, the General Accounting Office, which is the budget watchdog for the U.S. Congress, the average income that a doctor gets off of a type 2 diabetic who lives 25 to 40 years after diagnosis is $750,000. There's no law requiring him to cure people when their cure is available. So which way is he going to go? 30 bucks or $750,000? Now, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. I just talked to the um, president of the NBA Players Association. His wife has diabetes. I just asked her one question. Do you drink soft drinks? She says, oh, yeah, I'm a Coca-Cola alcoholic. I have to have 20 or 30 a day. Well, look at this. This is a study on 91,000 women over eight years. 91,000 nurses over eight years. Women in the study who drank at least one sugar-sweetened soda were 85% more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than ones who just drank water or even Diet Coke. 85% increase. You're going to get it. If you drink one Coca-Cola a day, it's just a matter of time. If you drink two, it's going to be faster. If you drink three, it's faster. But if you just drink one a day, you have an 85% chance of getting diabetes. And you know, when you talk to people about the, oh no, my doctor says it's genetic. Whatever turns your crank, cut way back on the carbohydrates, eat six small meals a day with animal protein in them, watch what happens. Weight goes down, blood sugar goes down, you live a normal life. Well, I have to ask my doctor permission. Okay, last one is arthritis and osteoporosis, according to the Center for Disease Control. 85% of Americans after the age of 50, or by the age of 50, already have osteoporosis or arthritis of one type or another to one degree or another. There's not a single medical treatment designed to prevent or fix it. Aspirin, Celebrex, Vioxx, Tylenol, Ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Methotrexate, Gold Shots, Prednisone, Cortisone, none of them fix it. They all have terrible side effects, many of which are life-threatening. And cure arthritis and osteoporosis in animals over 300 years ago in Europe and over 1,000 years ago in Asia. So why don't doctors use that? Well, there's no money in it. There's, remember we already said there's no money in the cure? If Doc Smith were to cure all his patients of arthritis and osteoporosis today and the word got out he was curing people, the, the line would go around the earth three times and he'd have one heck of a good month. But what would he do for the rest of his life? He'd be broke because there's no money in a cure. The money is in milking the insurance program.
If you follow your doctor when it comes to arthritis and osteoporosis and other degenerative diseases, this is what you're going to look like by the time you're 75, 80 years old. Yahoo! And then I look forward to that. Man, oh man, diabetes, back surgery, hip replacements, knee replacements, bone spurs, high blood pressure, Alzheimer's disease, triple bypass. I'll bet you he was a very... Con Whatever you say, doctor. Now, this problem starts when you're young. This problem starts when you're weaned off of milk. I see so many kids today, thousands of them a month, thousands a month. Oh, he has Charlie Hart. Is he three years old and he has leg cramps and the doctor says it's growing pains. I know it's something different. Well, you give him any supplements? No. Are you giving him apple? Oh, he, oh, he loves apple juice and orange juice he, and, and grape juice. I mean, he just lives for orange juice and grape juice and apple juice. Well, how much calcium and magnesium and boron and strontium and silica are in there? How much sulfur is in apple juice and grape juice? Uh, none. This is out of uh, Australia, but this is absolutely true. I just like this because of the little red, this island of Tasmania. Three quarters of young Australians and Americans aged 12 to 15 are not getting enough calcium. 75% because they're all living on bottled water. They're all living on apple juice and grape juice and, and worse yet, Oh, yeah, Sunny D, Sunny Delight. Yeah. There's only 2% juice. It says right on the label, 2% juice. The rest of it's sugar water. But every kid loves it because they got great advertisement on TV. I have to have my Sunny Delight. Crack. <laughs> this is the one that really shook up the players. Arthroscopic knee surgery for arthritis is worthless. Yet the 5,000 doctors in America who specialize in arthroscopic knee surgery for degenerative joint disease... In 2001, their income from that one procedure is $1.5 billion. Why would they give it up? There's no law requiring them to give it up just because it's useless. Last slide. This is one you've been waiting for. Osteoporosis strikes both sexes equally. Since 1958, doctors wanted you to believe that osteoporosis was primarily a postmenopausal woman's problem. Would you believe it or not? How many of you heard that? If you don't raise your hand, you're a liar. You're a commie. You're asleep. Because I know you've all heard it. But osteoporosis strikes men equally with women. How come you men aren't being shuttled through getting your bone density tests like women? Well, because doctors make too much money on HRT, kickbacks. And if they were to let women know that men get it equally with, with women, how could you justify giving estrogen, which causes increase in cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and cardiovascular disease? You couldn't justify it. Because, I mean, how many red-blooded American men are going to walk into their OBGY and say, okay, doc, I got osteoporosis in my family. I want you to shoot me up with that, uh, you know, that estrogen stuff. That's not going to happen, is it? And so that's why there's no carbonated drinks and give up fried foods and margarines and cooking oils and meat cooked well done and burnt animal fats. Just doing those things, you'll have 30, 40, 50 healthful years of your life. I, I have to ask my doctor. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements discussed have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.